Welcome to the More We Know podcast with your host and social media influencer, Mir. Gen Z's and Millennials. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the More We Know podcast. I am your host, Mir. This podcast was launched for my fellow Gen Z's and Millennials as a mentorship platform to bring on experts from all around the world to provide you guidance, mentorship, education on their individual and respective journeys. Today, I am really pleased to have a phenomenal guest by the name of Julian Sanchez, who is a legally blind analyst at Goldman Sachs, who recently was featured on Business Insider, opening up about his struggle to get to Wall Street and his fight to help other people with disabilities score their dream jobs. I mean, if you have not heard of Julian before, you're going to after this because his story is remarkable. It's inspirational. It's different. And I am so honored to have you on today. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Samir, thanks so much for having me. It's a privilege and super excited. Julian, let's let's dive right into it. So Walk me through, you know, obviously I just spoke about the headline we saw at Business Insider, but I, I want to take it back, you know, walk me through your actual childhood growing up, you know, with a disability, what, what that life looked like, the support from the parents. I'm really curious to hear the background story. Yeah, no, for sure. So I think I had anything but a <laughs> kind of typical childhood. I had a great childhood. Um, you know, I grew up in Southern California, moved around a ton, but you know, at the age of two, I was diagnosed with a condition um, that required me to have a organ transplant at the age of two. Um, so my mom gave me that organ. And, you know, it was kind of rough sailing from the get go. But, you know, I, I was resilient. I always kept, you know, a very, very positive attitude. And one of my first memories actually was I was at home, like hooked up to dialysis and, you know, just on the couch hanging out at like three years old. And I started naming, like the TV was on, it was baseball. I started naming off these professional baseball players. You know, as I mentioned, I live in Southern Cal, I lived in Southern California. So they were Dodgers and this was at three years old. At that point, my parents were like, I mean, this is just, you know, TV was on kind of in passing. And I was just naming off these Dodger players. At that point, they knew that I was really into baseball and that, you know, I kind of took the things pretty quickly. Shortly after that, they took me to a Dodger game and behind us was Billy Crystal. And I started kind of doing a lot of the same, naming off these players and you know, doing what I did at home. Long story short, I went up uh, and saying, take me out to the ball game with Billy Crystal. And from there, I got a lot of interest from kind of these childhood actor agencies um, throughout Los Angeles. So I, I say all that to say, you know, I had an interesting childhood, definitely not easy, but I spent, you know, the ages two to six kind of pursuing that childhood acting dream. And then, you know, as happens with, with kids, you want to enjoy your childhood and hang out with your friends and so, and, and so on. So I decided to, you know, not do the acting thing as much. And then shortly after that, at the age of nine, my life kind of changed dramatically when I went blind. So I went blind um, pretty much through the underlying condition, which, which required me to have a transplant at the age of two. Um, but what I have is something called optic neuropathy. And what happened was, you know, one, one week I was kind of feeling sluggish and not so good. And I woke up one morning um, with completely no vision. And what had happened was I, I had a tremendous amount of blood loss um, throughout you know, the, the days uh, leading up to that. So as a nine-year-old, you know, with your, your personality set, and you know, like I said, I was very into baseball. I thought I was gonna conquer the world, be a professional athlete, do all those things that you know, nine-year-old boys kind of dream of. It was really challenging for me. And I was forced to live with the reality of you know, what do I do next? How do I deal? How do I live life as a, as a blind individual? And I was pretty resistant, to be honest. Um, it took me a while to take to, you know, normal things like walking with mobility cane, learning braille, kind of getting the assistance that I previously wasn't, wasn't used to. So that was a really challenging time in my life. Um, but, you know, ultimately I got through by doing the things I loved and kind of just altering it. So continuing to follow sports, skateboarding, 
walk, you know, hanging out with friends, that type of thing. So that that's what kept me sane. And then, you know, to kind of fast forward a little more, at the age of 16, I was diagnosed with cancer and it's called post-transplant lymph node disease, wow. which is common among transplant patients just because of the interaction of the anti-rejection medication. So yet again, I was forced to kind of re rethink um, how I did things and you know, ultimately ended up spending the majority of junior and senior year from a you know, program called Hospital Homebound and from, from home. So that, that point in, in my life was pretty challenging and given, you know, I was so social and I tried to keep a positive attitude and a, um, keep a social group and continue to do the things I love. But you know, that became very challenging through those high school years for sure. Um, Julian, it's, it's, it's actually uh, emotional to even just listen to the story because I think when, we, when you look at, you know, typical kids, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, even kids in high school, a lot of the, the day-to-day worries that they have might be about, you know, their Roblox membership or the new shoes that they want or, or just all, you know, playing or not being a starter player on the basketball team. Um, by the time you were 16, you were legally blind and you also got cancer, correct? That's right. How, how, how as a 16 year old, were you able to develop such a powerful, awe-inspiring mindset to take both of those situations and, and persevere and push through that at that age? So look, I, I think like for me, having a great support system it is really key. I mean, my, my parents, you know, my dad um, is very much like no excuses. You can do whatever you set your mind to. And I know that's cliche, but, but I took it to heart. And really of the mindset, don't look back, look forward, control what you can control. And ultimately, you know, listen to people and their opinions. But if you think it's reasonable, if you're willing to put in the work, just don't, you know, don't take no for an answer. And I think, I think having that grit is something that I see as a common DNA and in, in, in the biggest successful people right so and you clearly embody that which is your capabilities and and what you've accomplished now even where you're at at goldman um but so walk me through now when you get to your college age where'd you go to school and what what was college like the experience there yeah so kind of taking taking it back a little to high school i was told you know my senior of, of high school despite having you know very good grades, I was pretty studious. I was told that that college might not be for me. So that was kind of a pivotal point in my life where I was being told by many that, you know, college may not even be the right decision. So, you know, once I got over that, again, my, my support system, my dad, you know, with kind of that, you can do what you need. And my mom, the more motherly supportive type, if I didn't mention it before, my mom gave me the kidney at the age of two. So kind of that dichotomy of like, rigidness and like uh, appropriate support you know really supported me and then you know I have a brother that's five years older than me or five years younger than me sorry that really just pushed me to say you know what I think college is is the right move and encouraging me along the way Um, so I went to University Illinois Chicago right out of high school and a lot of the you know, what I thought success looked like from, you know, disability perspective where people are visually impaired, that track kind of looked like, you know, politics or law or, you know, things of that nature, which I really took a liking to. Um, So I thought I was going to law school early on in my college career, but I took an econ class and really liked it. I would say, you know, the the way my mind works is I'm very like, like matter of fact, factual, like I like one plus one equals two and that's kind of how it goes. So in some ways, the politics legal side of things, at least at that time, were very theoretical. And once I took an economics class, although obviously there's theory there as well, it was more kind of, here's how the economy works, here's how markets work. And I really took a liking to that. But 
you know, uh, during my sophomore year, some health complications uh, came up yet again, and I was forced to take two years off of school um, because I was just feeling um, pretty sick. So at that point, it was my liver and kidney were actually not doing well. And in 2013, after two years of undergrad, I received a double organ transplant actually at the University of Chicago. But once I recovered, you know, I was obviously, I was very focused on getting back to school. So I continued my undergrad at University of Southern California, which um, to be honest, going back to school, this was the first time I was living on my own. The first time I had to worry and kind of fend for myself. So it presented a number of its own challenges. I mean, to be frank, like, it was the first time I had gone to a, a real party. You know, I, I pledged a fraternity and was one of the first um, blind students to, you know, to be involved in Greek life at the time. So it was just a whole nother set of, of challenges and ultimately great times. But, you know, that, that kind of was a pivotal point. And once at USC studying econ finance, I really steered into that. But as a junior, getting into finance, um, kind of figuring it out later is pretty challenging with how recruiting goes. So I had to think you know, creatively again, and I decided to do my master's in finance directly after um, I graduated undergrad. So I did the master's in finance program at USC in Southern California as well. And just through taking those classes, my interest and in, in what turned into passion for finance continued. Um, luckily, at, you know, the USC has an incredible Trojan network and support system. I was able to secure two internships in investment banking through connections I had in alumni at USC. And once I went out on the market recruiting, although challenging, you know, I was, I think, in a, a pretty good spot, I would say you know, diversity and inclusion at that point, you know, which is about three years ago, may not have had the tailwinds that it has now. And companies, although excited and like open-minded about it, I think there were still questions around operationally what it looked like. And so in applying, you know, kind of obviously Goldman was at the top of my list and I was lucky enough to secure some interviews and that takes me to, you know, I received the full-time offer. And the, the thing about Goldman, the process was just different for me. Um, from the interviews, like I got a lot of very straightforward technical prowess. Um, you know, do you fit the role? Do you have the experience type of questions? And from that moment on, I knew that it was different. I got the offer that landed me here in Salt Lake City where I sit in, the, in credit risk. And I've been here for about two and a half years. Wow. Um, real quick, I'm going to go right back to that point. But Julian, the video had gone off for a second. Yes, sir. Let me, I hope it's not my phone. Yeah, your video, it went to, it says Jacob's iPhone now. Here we go. Back. We should be back, right? Yeah, yeah. All good now. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, to land a job at Goldman um, is Goldman, as the world knows, is one of the most prestigious companies in the world, right? Uh, when you think investment banking and, and Pinnacle, Goldman is is at the top in, in, in a rigorous process with, with the prestige that comes with the name. You know, what was that feeling like describing your journey from being legally blind, from being diagnosed multiple times, from even being told? It sounds like there's this mantra where you were told a few times over and over, you can't do this right? Even in college, they said, yeah, it's probably not for you. And you still kind of persevered. And on top of it, went to get your master's. And then on top of it, compounded and went to Goldman. What was the feeling like of, of actually getting the Goldman offer? So for me, I, it was, it's interesting because um, I just really like try to take one step at a time. So, you know, there was more so like a, a lot of small victories you know, landing at, at Goldman obviously was a, a monumental step, but I just kind of took it step by step, right? Like get into a good master's program, um, get, you know, learn the core curriculum, get good grades, uh, get 
get internships. So it was like a stepping, like a lot of steps. And I can't say that I expected it, but I had been working hard for it um, for a very long time. So it wasn't, it wasn't really a surprise. It was more a surprise on like the things that I couldn't control, but I think I did everything in my power to make sure that I set myself up well. Now, on, on this path and, and getting to that and, and even broader than just Goldman, uh, there, there takes a sense, I, I'd like to think of, of self-belief uh, and a relentless self-belief of, of whatever you're going to do at any point, whether it's high school, college, or applying or doing internships with investment banking, you know, candidly, did you ever have any self-doubt or were you always just extremely confident in yourself? I, th- I was just raised with, with, you know, extreme positivity. You know, I think particularly in health, right? Your mindset is a huge factor in my mind in the ultimate outcome of any health situation. So like you have to be in the right head spaces to, to kind of fight those battles. So that was just kind of who I was. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, getting to Goldman is hard, but not to discredit it, the health challenges I went through uh, were much, much tougher. Yeah. I think I think perspective is what you're mentioning there, right? Having perspective. Yeah. And a, a lot of my generation of Gen Zs, we struggle to gain that perspective because nowadays with social media, Julian, we struggle with seeing the perfect lifestyles. And on social media, unfortunately, and this is a metaphor, you see the makeup. You don't see what goes on behind the journey, the mission, et cetera. So what, what advice could you instill for us Gen Zs that struggle to gain that perspective? I, I would just say there's a couple of things like you don't always have to have all the right answers, but just being able to step back and say, okay, how, what is the gravity of the situation in the context of, you know, what could be happening? i um, just kind of developing a site for that perspective is really key. And I think the other point is, you know, maybe cliche, but I think it's super important being an individualist and saying, just because my, my best friend is in the Bahamas enjoying, you know, uh, an adult beverage on the beach and I'm sitting here working. That doesn't mean I have a terrible time. Right. So it, it, it's just kind of being able to step back and say relative to how things could look, you know, things are, things are going well. And, you know, like you said, we have the luxury of on-demand satisfaction and that's, that's tough. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, and I hope the Gen Z's really take in what you said there, because that those are true gems there, especially kind of what you went through uh, and getting to where you got. So, you know, one thing in the, in the business insider interview, uh, you opened up about sort of your struggle to get to wall street in general. Now, would you say that struggle, was it more so just because traditionally, you know, w- with what you, the disability you had uh, it's, it's tougher to uh, on potentially do certain tasks. Like what, what was that struggle like? because you made it happen. I would say that it was, it was a lot of the not knowing um, for me, like there wasn't a ton of people that I could look to for guidance. Like, you know, how, how things work at, at, you know, a lot of universities is there's, there's clubs and groups and things that help and mentor. And, and for sure I got those, but the reality was I could confidently say none of my mentors in that regard had a visual impairment. So it was kind of learning as I went. Um, again, like I received nothing but positivity, you know, from the, on the recruiting side, but it was just a lot of, of unknowns. And, you know, unfortunately those barriers only come down when the experience is out there, when people know what to do and how to do it. Yeah. I, uh, you know, we're always going to be faced with unknowns in our life. And, and, and the point is, you're living proof of someone that can take those unknowns of, no, you probably shouldn't do this and accomplish what you did. And, and I just think that's what's so inspirational. When I first read your story and just listening to you talk now, it's living proof to me that in this world, whatever you're told, if it's a no, if it's doubt, you have to have a relentless vision and a relentless self-belief and you're, you're living proof of that. Now, not only did you secure a job with Goldman, but it's my understanding now that you're, you're, you're helping others, other people with disabilities score their dream jobs. Walk me, walk me through that remarkable journey and, and inspiration that you're helping others with disabilities. So for me, like, it's always really important to, to be able to give back 
even at like a young age, I try to like volunteer at the Lives of the Blind, Ronald McDonald House, some other organizations, because they had been so integral in, you know, me having a positive outlook and just a re- like I like I mentioned a really good support system. So it had always been the case that, that I wanted to figure out ways to give back. And then, you know, to that, my path was not straightforward. We talked about those unknowns. Like for me, it's important to kind of shed light on those unknowns to anyone who's interested in, in forget about finance, entering business, um, you know, with maybe not even a visual impairment, but a disability at large. So it's really important for me to think about and continue to think about how I can give back. And so when I got to Goldman, I was made aware of the Analyst Impact Fund. And with the Analyst Impact Fund, for those who don't know, it's a Shark Tank-like um, setup where Goldman analysts across the world get the opportunity to pitch um, across multiple rounds, a nonprofit of their choice, for the chance to win funding for their non for profit So, you know, my second year here, um, and we could talk about a little bit, Lime Connect is the, the charity that I kind of had top of mind for a long time. And their vision is rebranding disability through achievement. And what that means is they have a base of network members who, who happen to have disabilities and they support them in the recruiting process, in the disclosure part process, how to request accommodations, all of those things that are pretty challenging to someone with a disability to go through in recruiting, they try to help and guide in that way. And then the other side of that is they connect with leading corporate partners who really value uh, diversity and inclusion. So corporations like, like Goldman, like Bloomberg, like Google, those types. And I was involved in that in undergrad and Lyme was a huge um, you know, factor in, in my success in figuring out the way. So once uh, this, this past year, you know, 2021 fall, you got a team together with you know, a couple other Lyme network members and we pitched Blime and we were passionate and we had a connection to it. And in December, we were able to secure first prize, $250,000 for Lime Connect in the GS Analyst Impact Fund. And Lime Connect, you know, what they're going to use that 250 for is really expand um, their base, reach more members, reach more, more corporate partners and through what they're calling the hub. And that's a, it's going to be a digital platform that connects all their current offerings. So the resources, the corporate partners, the forums, it's going to be a one-stop shop for all of that. So we were really excited to, to, to support Lime in, in what we feel is, is their next stage of growth. Yeah, congratulations on that. It's it's truly remarkable being able to do that as well. And, and the fact that you're not only, you know, living proof, but you're helping others, you're paving the way. And that's, that's what I like to think when I think of the word legacy, you're leaving a legacy for others, which is truly phenomenal. Um, now, what, what takeaways could you give us from this whole journey? When you look at it, you know, you sort of walked us through your background, you know, getting to Goldman, which is a prestigious job, and now creating this help for others and disabilities and, and these competitions. Um, what advice could you give someone just graduating college that might be facing their own barrier? Maybe they're not going through being disabled, but maybe they're facing their own barrier that, that is, is, is valid. What advice could you give for 21 year olds that are just scared and nervous about the world? I, I would say that, you know, no matter who you are, no matter your background, your situation, chances are, you know, everyone faces adversity, right? What, Whatever that looks like is obviously an indi- on an individual basis, but just know um, you're, you're not alone. And I would really look towards things that you're passionate about, things that get you excited. And I think a huge thing that maybe gets overlooked when you think you have purpose in life, it can really propel you to that next level and help you. Um, get through some pretty challenging things. So find purpose in, you know, your work, in your school, in, you know, your family relationships. Um, that's that's kind of what drove me. And like I mentioned, my family's a huge part. My dad, my mom, my brother, they always kind of, you know, were that support system that let me know, like, you're not, you're not going through this alone. And, and even, you know, going forward, like my friends, my university, Goldman, like those are all support systems so 
um, wrap, kind of wrapping it up, I would say know that you're not going through it alone, find purpose and, you know, lean on your support system. And do you think through the challenges you faced in your life, which I like to think were successes in a way, because you ended up turning it into such a positive situation. Do you think that people should shift their mindset from looking at setbacks, whether that be tragedy, whether that be God forbid, losing a parent or God forbid, getting in a car accident and being permanently disabled. Do you think that people should look at setbacks as opportunities for growth and, and potentially, you know, helping others? Absolutely. I think, you know, it's like we talked about, it's all about perspective and, you know, I'm a firm believer that you could turn those setbacks and opportunities that ultimately will make you stronger. That will, you know, for, from kind of just using an example, I believe my health setbacks and the successes of those kind of gave me that mindset I needed to break into like, you know, college, to break into an industry that's very difficult to, to get into. Those health setbacks were, I think, directly correlated with um, you know, how I was able to fare during all of that. Right. And I, I couldn't agree with you more on that again. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Again, I'm just, I'm, I'm so inspired today because I find myself even hosting this podcast for Gen Z's. I struggle with sometimes first world problems and thinking I can't do this and, and still finding a way. So, so you've impacted us that, that way tremendously. Now, as you look forward at the next decade of your career, you know, what do you hope to accomplish? I would say I'm still very, very, you know, fresh in finance. So becoming a finance expert, continuing to, to try to be involved in non-for-profits and, you know, encourage people. Again, not, not everyone wants to be in finance. I get that. But, you know, people with disabilities or otherwise that want to pursue challenging careers that it's possible. And then, you know, uh, just continuing to, to help out in any way I can, whether it's you know, blogging a book, et cetera, like just continuing to, to help out where, wherever it makes sense. And look, I love finance. So hopefully I continue on that route and get a ton of experience and, and do that. And, and you're doing that. And I, and I think from this podcast with all our Gen Z listeners, uh, you're, you are a name to remember because you're living proof of the can and you will and regardless having that relentless pursuit now for you because you've gone through so much and and you're still extremely young do you now i'm just curious when when you go through whether it's a potential failure whether you know if 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 you lose in something or or god forbid you get some bad news do you just do you have a bulletproof mindset now where you don't take bad news as bad news or do you still kind of struggle with setbacks so i think there's like so i'll, I'll bifurcate it because health right you don't have as much control you know you you have control up into a point so in that in that scenario you kind of have to let things roll off your shoulders i think just to speak candidly i struggle in the setbacks where i have a hand in the outcome and i you know i think that's that's pretty normal and typical but you know maybe i just don't i don't let it bug me as much but to say i don't struggle with setbacks at all that that would be an understatement i think i struggle with the setbacks that that you know i had a hand in maybe not coming out as, as well as i wanted it to yeah yeah that's 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 great perspective there too because i think at the end of the day still you know we we all struggle with our own setbacks and and, and it's hard to develop a, a strong mindset but it's 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 realizing that over time measured steps we can we can achieve that now um, in within your situation now, what what do you see as the biggest struggles, you know, day to day, even outside of work, being legally blind? You know, like what what are things that can give us perspective and gratitude from from your situation as you inspire so many around the world? Yeah, I mean, like I I still have to like match my clothes in the morning, right? Like I still have to look presentable every day. <laughs> so just just the the little things like that, you know, like. Yeah. For me, transportation is a thing, and thank thank goodness for Uber and Lyft and and other <laughs> things like that. Like I, I kind of joke, you know, had I had been visually impaired in the seventies, eighties, like I I may not have been able to do what you know the things that that I wanted to do. So I, like technology is an incredible thing. I think it's my best friend and worst enemy at times. Um, but like you know, just you know, to your to your direct question. There's definitely struggles around like 
you know, how am I going to work? Or like, you know, how am I going to match this blue shirt with these gray pants or well, silly things, right? Yeah. They don't mean anything, but they're absolutely kind of at least, you know, slight, like, you know, a couple second things that I got to just think harder about on the day to day. Yeah. And, and, and for me, you know, it's, it's a lot of times where I'll be annoyed if I, if I, if I have to make a meeting and I can't get my Starbucks that day and it's, and it's so trivial, right? It's like, oh my gosh, when you look at the macro level, a lot of the things we complain about on our day to day are not that serious. And so when I listen to you and your story, you know, when I struggle with weight, right, I'm trying to lose my last 100 pounds and I still make excuses every day, like of, of why I'm not accomplishing it. And then when I hear a story, you know, uh, a remarkable story like yours, or there's some people that, that can't walk, it's so important to have that gratitude. Don't get it. Yeah, but I'm still upset when they don't have, you know, green tea at Starbucks too. So it, <laughs> I know, right? It's, the green tea is the go-to. So. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And and so <laughs> as Star Starbucks, is, is green tea your favorite? Yeah, I do green tea, a little splash of peach. So that's kind of a thing. <laughs> Hey, that's the signature right there. I'm going to try that. I haven't tried it with a splash of peach. It's good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I suggest it. Okay, I will, I will let you know how it goes. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. If they don't have it, though, my day is going to be shattered. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to pick up and, God forbid, go to McDonald's and get coffee. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, I think it's just, it's 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 so cool to 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 meet someone who has such a journey. And, and I, again, when I look at your journey, I don't even like to look at it as something that's like a challenge or a setback. I like to look at it as the fact that when I read the story initially and, and I saw in Business Insight, I was like, wow, this is like true inspiration here. This is this is what the world's about, being able to go through something like this and being able to share that. Do you think, do you think that sometimes things happen to people because there's a greater purpose there? I would like to think so. Like, I, I don't know, right? I just try to live yeah. day by day and... I'm not going to, you know, uh, pose that things happen exactly how are they, they were supposed to. Maybe, probably, but like, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's looking back on everything that happened, you know, I can say a lot of it was not coincidental. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to be over the top conspiracy theorist. Like, <laughs> it happened exactly how it was supposed to, when it was supposed to happen and, and all of that stuff. But mm -hmm. You know, there there is something to be said about things happening at the right place in the right time. Like I, I do believe that at some yeah. level. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And again, it's 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 the fact that you're not only able to go through that journey yourself, but impact others in the process. Now, for the listeners that are listening in, we have thousands of Gen Zs that listen in monthly. How, how can we support you as well? I know you talk about, you know, ser the services you got going on and, and Goldman is a, is a great supporter of that. Is there anything that the listeners can connect with you on if they want to provide or help in any way with, with uh, what you're working on? Yeah, you know, I would say do it for yourself, right? So just keep positive and keep a equal head on your shoulders, you know, I, um, all of that is super helpful. And I, you know, I gain inspiration from, from other similar people achieving their goals. Um, I, so that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of a, in, in the conclusion, what does your day to day look like? And, and I'm not even talking about work. I'm just saying, what do you do in terms of just developing a mindset, your day to day? What, what, how do you structure your, your sort of day? Like I try to be structured. I try to wake up at a certain time. Like I, I try to have things parsed out as, as evenly and as accurately as possible. But like the reality is things come up, right? So I think you have to be flexible. And for me, a huge thing is allocating time mm. because just the reality of it is things take a little bit longer. So I have to be very, very good at time management. So, you know, waking up in the morning, I shower at this time, I get ready, I leave this time. I'm planning my day inside of that construct as, as good as I can. Um, and then just keeping that, that positivity throughout the day, right? So just saying like taking the little wins and carrying those through to the next, you know, the next meeting or the next interaction or, or what have you. And a lot of times we forget about the little wins, just like when I mentioned to you about weight loss, when I lost my first 100 pounds, 
I was looking at it as, hey, it's one pound at a time. The second time it's been, it's been a struggle because one, I did it before, but two, I'm thinking, how can I lose 10 pounds in a week or how can I do this? And it's so, it's so looking at the macro like that, just the hip dehabilitates you because then you start getting demotivated by not hitting your micro goals. So, yeah, just take it one step at a time, one win at a time, take the step back. So, you know, I'm sure it's been said by multiple people, but take them as a, a, an opportunity to kind of step back, reassess, gain your, you know, your bearings, your perspective, and then, you know, take, take whatever yeah. comes at, at face value. No, I love that. And if you could go back right now, because you're giving a lot of, you know, 21 year olds advice here, if you could go back right now to college, anything you would tell yourself you would do differently? Mm, I would even say like childhood, like I was pretty, so for me, like my, we'll call it determination, right, can be both a negative and a positive because the reality is sometimes people that have gone through certain things before, they have really good insight and perspective. So I say you could be determined, but but like I would encourage myself not to be unreasonable or hard or hard headed. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I like that. I I think a lot of us are very stubborn and hard headed. So to look back at that, it's it's key there. Um, look, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being so vulnerable and opening up with your story. Um, and, and it gives at least myself hope. And I know the listeners hope that despite what you go through in this life, my takeaway from this interview is, is you can make it happen and whatever you want to do, because you took every situation, every setback, every dire news, so to speak, and still were able to go so far in your life and land a job at a, a great company like Goldman, and then continue that legacy and build what you got going on. So I, I want to thank you for sharing that story, being vulnerable, and also continuing to impact others and, and, and shaping quite possibly Wall Street for the future as well with getting other people with disabilities jobs. It's, it's remarkable. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And, you know, I'm, I'm super excited for, for what's to come next. And hopefully that this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, guys. That is Julian Sanchez out of Goldman, who is a legally blind analyst helping the disabled community get a job on not only Wall Street, but impact and empower their lives and score their dream jobs overall. So his story is just one to remind you that when you're going through your own tragedy, whatever it might be, no one's discounting that, you can accomplishment, but you do have to have that relentless pursuit. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you.